cancer, that was the goal was for people to know what to look for so women aren't ignoring symptoms of ovarian cancer and they're getting in and getting things checked out. So, so what is cancer, first of all? Cancer is a disease in which normal cells of the body grow out of control. We know that cancer starts in areas of the body where the cells are constantly changing. So either normally constantly changing or like in esophageal cancer, if someone has reflux and the esophagus is constantly repairing itself, then that's a place where cancer happens. Of course, the ovaries are constantly changing because they go through a total change every month with ovulation. There are usually cancers named for the part of the body where the cancer originates, ovarian cancer. Um, so ovarian cancer originates in the ovaries, although some studies point to this cancer starting in the fallopian tubes. And in doing my research for this talk, there were a few things that I learned too that I didn't know that um, they had found with research, and this was one of them, that they're really thinking that some of the ovarian cancers are actually starting in the fallopian tubes. So what's the risk? This is the statistics. Um, in the U.S. for 2018, the American Cancer Society is estimating that about 22,240 women will receive a new diagnosis of ovarian cancer. Okay, new diagnosis and about 14,070 women will die from ovarian cancer. Okay, so really a little over half. Okay, that's the problem with ovarian cancer. Um, okay, I missed a slide, here we go. So in Illinois for 2018, again, American Cancer Society statistics, about 850 women will receive a new diagnosis of ovarian cancer. 560 will die from ovarian cancer, okay? Now, not everybody that's diagnosed dies, and not everybody that's diagnosed dies in the same year they're diagnosed, so there's a little skew to the numbers. But you could, in comparison, I put down here that just breast cancer, so that you can see how it kind of compares. So. Estimated in 2018 in Illinois, 9,960 women will receive the diagnosis of breast cancer. 1,720 will die from the breast cancer. You can see the difference. Up here, you know, we're looking at over half. And down here, what, a fourth? Breast cancer, we have mammograms and ultrasounds and it's, it's, I don't know if I should say easier to diagnose, but the, it, the ovaries are tucked away. It's hard to detect ovarian cancer. So ovarian cancer ranks fifth in cancer deaths among women, accounting for more deaths than any other cancer of the female reproductive system. Lifetime risk is one in 78. So when we talk about how fatal ovarian cancer can be, it's not very common. So less than 2% lifetime risk for women in the general population. And what I mean by general population is women who aren't at increased risk, and we're gonna talk about that, but women who aren't at increased risk of ovarian cancer. And they say that the rate at which women are diagnosed with ovarian cancer has been dropping over the last 20 years. So that's a good thing. They did not say why that was happening. So what increases risk? Age increases our risk for everything, right? Um, it's rare in women who are younger than 40. Most ovarian cancers <coughs> develop after menopause. Half of all ovarian cancers are found in women who are 63 and older. Obesity increases risk. I would guess, uh, they didn't go into why this happens, but I think that in people who have extra body fat, body fat produces estrogen, and estrogen can cause some issues. 
in the uterus and for the ovaries and for the breasts. So I'm thinking that's why they say that this whole obesity increasing risk is part of it. The other thing I would say about this is in clinical practice, if I'm doing a pelvic exam on somebody and they have a little extra insulation, it's hard to feel through that, to feel the ovaries and uterus and feel if there's a pelvic mass or anything there that I need to be concerned about. Just makes it really hard to feel anything, to know if everything's okay. So, and then having your first pregnancy after the age of 35 or never having a term pregnancy. And then fertility treatments. People who are bombarded with hormones to get their ovaries to function so they produce a lot of eggs so they can get pregnant, that we know increases the risk of ovarian cancer as well. Hormone therapy after menopause. And this is for estrogen alone for five to 10 years or more. Um, risk is, um, they're not sure about risk if women are taking estrogen and progesterone together. So the old Prempro and some of that. Hormones really kind of fell out of favor with the whole Women's Health Initiative study and we just don't do a whole lot with hormones at this point. Family history of ovarian, colorectal, or breast cancer. We know that there's a connection there with risk for your genetics, and we're gonna talk about that here in a minute. Past personal history of breast, uterine, or ovarian cancer. So if, if you're someone who has a history of breast cancer, your risk for ovarian cancer is actually higher. Um, having a family history, or having a family cancer syndrome. Family cancer syndrome accounts for five to 10% of ovarian cancers. Okay, only five to 10%. We get all hung up on this family history with ovarian and breast cancer, and it's just a small percent of the new diagnosis of those cancers. So I have patients tell me all the time, well, I'm not getting my mammogram because I don't have a family history. Well, that only accounts for about 20% of breast cancer diagnoses. So you need to have your mammogram because you're at risk. Um, some of the genetics that we found, Lynch and BRCA, are some of the cancer syndromes, the genetic cancer um, syndromes that increase risk for breast, ovarian, colon cancer. We're doing more and more with testing people for these. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit. And then the tumor suppressor genes. One of the articles I was looking at really did a good job of explaining that um, not only are there genetic links where there's a genetic glitch that may increase your risk for certain cancers, but there might be another genetic glitch where the, the protective things we have in our bodies that rebuild those genes and fix errors in them are broken. And so they don't go in and repair those genes and repair the DNA and fix things. So it's kind of a double, it can be a double issue or two possible problems. Um, age when menstruation started or ended. Um, beginning early can increase the risk, ending late can increase the risk. Generally, the more times a woman ovulates in her life, the more at risk, the higher the risk. Okay, hereditary breast or ovarian cancer syndrome. This is the BRCA1 and BRCA2. This is, if you follow people or entertainment tonight or whatever, Angelina Jolie had a BRCA. I'm not sure which one, but she had a BRCA, had bilateral mastectomy because of her increased risk for breast cancer. Sometimes these women have um, breast removed, ovaries removed, depending on what they have and what they're found to be more at risk for. So this syndrome is linked to a high risk of breast cancer as well as ovarian, fallopian tube, and primary peritoneal cancers. Peritoneum is the lining of the abdomen. Also increases risk for pa uh, pancreatic and prostate cancer. So men are involved in all this too. Just because you don't have ovaries doesn't get you off the hook for all of this. 
Um, mutations of BRCA1 and BRCA2 are 10 times more common in those who are Ashkenazi Jew than the general U.S. population. Lifetime risk of ovarian cancer for women with BRCA1 mutation is between 35 and 70 percent and between 10 and 30 percent by age of 70 for BRCA2. Okay, so it really increases the risk. Remember general population risk was less than 2 percent? This really bumps the risk up. Are they absolutely going to get it? No. It doesn't mean they're going to get it. But we know what to look for. We can do some things to prevent it from happening. And then the history of endometriosis. And again, they didn't really explain why. I was a little surprised by that one too. But um, I think it probably has to do with endometriosis is when the inside lining of the uterus gets outside the uterus and implants itself in the pelvis. And so those cells go through the changes just like the lining of the uterus does. And when I said at the beginning that cells that are frequently changing are at risk for cancer, that's those cells right there in, in the endometrium. So what reduces risk? Pregnancy and breastfeeding. Again, the less times you ovulate in your life, the lower your risk. Pregnancy, you know, you don't ovulate for the 10 months. If you breastfeed, it lasts longer. Um, birth control, birth control pills. The risk is lower the longer the pills are used and the protection continues for many years after the pill is stopped. When I went through my MP program 27 years ago, they said that about five years, the protection for being on oral contraceptives, if you were on it for at least five years, the protection lasted for five years. They didn't quantify it in the article I was looking at, so I don't know, I can't give you a specific number, but the pills do have a protective factor. Again, they stop ovulation. IUDs, um, they did not say, we have different types of IUDs, and IUDs are an interuterine device that's planted in the uterus for birth control. Some of them have hormone in them, some of them do not. So I don't know if it's the hormone that is affecting things or if it's the actually mechanically having the IUD in place. One of the articles talked about how the risk for, um, they think that some of the ovarian cancer risk comes from things that may come through the vagina, through the cervix, into the uterus, through the fallopian tubes and into the pelvis. So I don't know if just the mechanically having the IUD in there, I'm not sure. Tubal ligation, just having the tubes clamped reduces the risk. Hysterectomy, uterus is gone. Again, it all seems to tie back to if there's something foreign that comes into the body through the vagina and uterus, that increases risk. And then of course, ovary removal reduces risk. So signs and symptoms. The paper that you guys got when you came in does a good job of listi listing signs and symptoms. So changes in a woman's period, such as heavier bleeding or irregular bleeding. And I would say for menopausal women who have stopped bleeding, if you start again, it's cause for concern, it needs to be checked out. Not just for the risk of ovarian cancer, but for the risk of uterine cancer as well. And if you don't have a uterus, you should still have it checked out because something's going on. Um, abdominal swelling, but weight loss. So your pants are getting tight, but the scale says you're losing weight. I think I missed a slide or two here, yep. Um, bloating, pelvic or abdominal pain, bel belly pain, um, trouble eating, or feeling full quickly, you eat and you just frequently feel like you're full and you hardly eat anything. Urinary symptoms like going more often or feeling like you've got to go right now. And I know that as women age, probably men too, but as women age, you have some of those symptoms. <laughs> this is more than or a worsening of those symptoms. Fatigue, really tired all of a sudden going on, I'm so tired. Um, upset stomach, 
just kind of nauseous, don't feel good. Back pain, pain during intercourse, constipation all of a sudden, and you've not had a history of constipation before. So you need to see your health care provider if you have any of these signs and symptoms for two weeks or longer, if, especially if they're not normal for you. Now, you can see with these signs and symptoms, they're all very vague. We can explain a lot of these away. Bloating, Thanksgiving's coming up, a little too much turkey, a little too much pumpkin pie, right? Pain, well, you know, you have some pain here and there, you kind of ignore it and, you know, we can't run to the doctor every time something hurts. Feeling full quickly, you know, you know, maybe you have a little reflux and so that flares up periodically and you feel that way. A lot of this can be pushed off as something else. So the whole point is to get people thinking about their bodies and what's normal for them and what the signs and symptoms are because they are very vague and very easy to miss. And by the time they get bad enough that people are paying attention, it's late stage. Ovarian cancer can be very aggressive and grow, can grow very quickly. Okay, so diagnosis. This is the really tricky part. There's no simple and reliable way to screen for ovarian cancer. We can do a mammogram for breast cancer. We can feel for a lump. Ovarian cancer, we check people if they come in once a year to do a pelvic exam, and it's really hard to feel the ovaries or feel if there's a mass there. And that's if there's a big enough mass for us to feel. If it's just starting and it's something tiny, we're not gonna feel that. Pap smear is not a test for ovarian cancer, okay? Pap smear is strictly a test for cervical cancer. That's it. Sometimes there are other things that show up, but it is only a test for cervical cancer. I'm gonna confuse you in a minute when we talk about what's new or what's coming, but pelvic exam, that's the feeling of the uterus and ovaries to see if there's anything there. I have found an ovarian cancer on a pelvic exam. Somebody came in for a routine annual, there was a mass there, did an ultrasound, it's cancer. Um, CA-125, has anybody heard of this blood test? Yeah, they, I don't know, the old Oprah and, you know, Cosmopolitan and, you know, different things, sometimes people talk about CA-125. CA-125 is a blood tumor marker. So you have your blood drawn and they look for this tumor marker, but it's used more to guide cancer treatment than it is to diagnose, okay? Again, this isn't going to be elevated until somebody, if it's elevated at all, it's not going to be elevated until somebody's later stage, ovarian cancer. So it's not found to be a good screening for ovarian cancer. Do I do them? Sometimes I do. If I have patients who come in and they have a family history of ovarian cancer, sometimes I do a CA-125 and a pelvic ultrasound on them every year because it's all we have at this point to do. So yes, sometimes I do them. The part of the problem with them is sometimes they're a little elevated and then what do you do with that? Everything looks okay on ultrasound, there's nothing there. Then you gotta follow this and that's expensive for the patient, nothing ever comes of it. So it's kind of a double-edged sword to do well. Um, pelvic ultrasound, we can look with the pelvic ultrasound and see if the ovaries look okay, if there's any growth in there if there's anything going on. But again, if we do that, and you had one six months ago, something could show up six months later and the ultrasound didn't pick it up. The ultrasound, again, needs to see something fairly large to see it. OVA1 is a, something kind of new. It's a blood test that's done that evaluates five different amino assays. One of them is CA-125, and it kind of compares and calculates. And it's, but it's used only for someone who has an ultrasound and has a mass there, and we're trying to decide is that mass worrisome or not. So again, it's not a diagnosis. You can't come into the doctor and say, okay, I want this test done to make sure I don't have ovarian cancer because that's not how it works. 
really depressed now. <laughs> I told you how scary it is. And okay, so what's new in the research? So PAP speak. I found this Nas um, National Institutes of Health is doing some research on this, and this is a test that can detect some endometrial and ovarian cancers at the early stages. And this was totally new to me. I didn't know they were doing this. I'm kind of excited about this though. It's liquid based and looks for cancer related alterations in DNA. So they can use the pap specimen because now all of our pap specimens are liquid based. If you've had a pap in the last I don't know, 10 years, you'll know that we put it in a bottle now. We don't do the old slide like we used to years ago. So it uses the pap specimen to look for ovarian cancer. Now, we don't have this now. Remember I told you, pap smear does not check for ovarian cancer, only cervical cancer. So far, it's not sensitive enough for diagnosis. So they did this on a bunch of women who already had ovarian cancer or already had endometrial cancer. And endometrial cancer is uterine cancer, basically. And it picked up most of them, but not all of them. And they were already diagnosed. They were already later stage. So it picked them up then. It's not picking them up regularly when it's a new cancer. So they're still working on that, but that would be really cool if they could get that fixed and do that. Research has shown that many ovarian cancers start in the fallopian tubes. Again, this was something new um, that I wasn't aware of. So studies are being done regarding removal of the fallopian tubes versus the ovaries in high risk women. So women uh, have a family history or they're BRCA positive and they're gonna have their ovaries removed. What they're looking at now is maybe they should be taking the fallopian tubes too, not just the ovary. So, so they're also doing more research with the genetics, like the BRCA1 and BRCA2, to find more chains of DNA that are problematic. Um, we've started doing, it's probably been five to eight years maybe, we've been doing BRCA testing in our office. And every once in a while, I will get a test back from the lab that says, okay, this patient was reported negative previously, so they didn't have BRCA1 or BRCA2, and they didn't have another gene that we're worried about. But now, with research, we found that this gene might be worrisome. So now I have to call the patient back and say, okay, you're negative for BRCA1 and 2, <coughs> but now through research and doing all this testing and stuff, they found that there's this new gene sequence that's an issue and you're at risk for whatever, colon cancer or whatever. So it's kind of cool though, that they're using all this information and they keep going over it and going over it and tweaking things so it's more specific and they're finding more and more gene links to cancers. So I think we're gonna see a lot of this. So far, 23andMe, has anybody done that? 23andMe DNA on Ancestry? It doesn't do this kind of stuff, but someday I'm wondering if it won't be part of the package. So what they found with the BRCA1 and BRCA2 testing is it's also helping to um, determine ways that they can better treat cancers with chemotherapy. They can target things a little better because they know that certain genetic abnormalities respond to certain chemotherapy regimens. So more information. People go out on the website and look for information and people, patients come in and they say, okay, I got on Google. I know I'm not supposed to do that. Well, no, you can do that. Just make sure you're on a good website and you don't scare yourself. That's the thing. So here's some websites that I used for my talk. I was on American Cancer Society a lot. Um, CDC.gov, I think that's where this came from. The, the uh, handout they gave you came from CDC. CDC is always a really good resource. Um, National Institutes of Health have really good information. Like I said, the um, PAP seek the new testing that they're looking at that they haven't tweaked yet is, um, they were talking about that. And I got a little information from Mayo Clinic too. Mayo Clinic has some good information too. So, questions? 
than anybody has. It's probably a combination of the two. <laughs> I'd like to blame the insurance company. But um, it's probably a combination of the two. I mean, there's risk to surgery. Mm -hmm. So we can't, I mean, ovarian cancer, less than 2% of the female population develops ovarian cancer. It's rare. I mean, you guys might all know somebody who has it or ha who has had it, but it is rare. So to go do surgery on every woman and remove their uterus and Fallopian tubes and ovaries, it seems extreme. Doesn't it seem? I know, I know. I get it, I get it. <laughs> Doesn't well, it yeah, seem when it's you and you still have your ovaries, it's scary. Yeah. 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 Doesn't it seem weird that Angelina Jolie could have an elective breast, you know? But she had that BRCA. She did. Yeah. She had BRCA. If, if someone's BRCA positive, okay. that's a different situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a totally different situ situation. So as they do more research and come up with more genes, more genetic links and stuff, then there may be more of that. But that's not elective then. There's a medical reason to right. do that surgery because that person, I mean, we looked at the statistics, their risk goes way up if they're positive mm -hmm. for one of the genetics. Hmm. Yeah. So that the test, the blood work that they do, you know, you go in No. The, the BRCA, you mean? Uh -huh. No. No, that, in our office, we do BRCA. We, everybody gets a questionnaire about family history. And, you know, do they have a family history of breast cancer? And who was it? And at what age were they diagnosed? And are there more than three people in the family? And so we go through this questionnaire, and if they meet some of those guidelines, then yes, they're offered that test. Now the tricky part with those tests are they're, they can be expensive. And so sometimes insurance will cover and sometimes they won't. And sometimes they'll cover some and not all of it. When we do the testing in our office, we draw the blood, tell the patient that basically it's going to be no more than $375 out of pocket. However, if it's going to be more than that, then the lab will call the patient and let them know and then get their permission to run the test. So the lab doesn't run the test until they get confirmation from the patient that they're willing to pay whatever the bill is if it's more than the 375. But sometimes it can be, you know, $1,500 to get the testing done. I know, it's really expensive, which isn't ideal, you know, people need to be tested. And whether the insurance approves of the testing is based on what the patient's family history is. You know, if your sister or mother had ovarian cancer or breast cancer or something like that, then they may pay for it. They're more apt to. If you go in with no family history, I have no family history. If I go in and say, I want BRCA testing done, they're gonna make me pay the whole thing. So I would have to decide how much I wanted that done. 